What's happening, everybody? Thanks for dropping in for another episode of the Crash Bang Boom podcast. Today's guest is drummer David Keith, who plays with Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, Blackmore's Night, Nelson, and Nashville artist Lalani Kilgore. David and I get to nerd out on all things Cozy Powell and Ian Pace, the bizarre backstory of how he got the Nelson gig, working with Lalani Kilgore, navigating some internet bashing, his crazy AOT drum company story, and a whole lot more. So I hope y'all enjoy it. Today's episode is sponsored by OneUpLoops.com. Drummer Carson Gann and his team spend an incredible amount of time recording over 450,000 shaker, tambourine, and hi-hat loops at every possible tempo and multiple fields with incredible mics and outboard gear for you to pick and choose. It's organized for you to find exactly what you need with just a few clicks and everything feels and sounds incredible. You can sign up for free to check it out and gain full access to all 450,000 loops starting at just $6 a month. No download limits, whatever you want, whenever you want. New loops, one shots, and drum breaks are being added weekly. Definitely a great addition to the arsenal of any drummer and or producer, and I can vouch for that. I haven't used it myself. So check it out at oneuploops.com. Crash Bang Boom podcast can be found where all podcasts are found. If you like what you hear, please check out any of the previous 295 episodes at Double High Fives. If you can give me a like, a subscription, and or a positive review, as it would be appreciated. All righty then, here we go. David Keith, Crash Bang Boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. Yes. All right, I'm here with David Keith. David, what's happening, dude? Hey, what's going on, Jody? How are you? Doing pretty good, man. Just uh, settling into the week. I'm I'm glad to catch up with you. I, uh, you're a guy that I originally became, I think, aware of from playing in the Netherlands. Who I, I lived in New York for 15 years. Oh, very cool. So that's how I think I originally became aware of you. And then, like looking more into it, I saw you were yeah. doing everything from you know Richie Blackmore's Rainbow to the Blackmore's Night, which is like a Celtic uh, folk castle like <laughs> theme thing happening. Oh yeah. Uh, as well as playing uh, shows with Nelson uh, from the 90s the the identical they're identical twins correct they have to they be. are yeah 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 they are not just yeah. a brother band an identical twin brother band that's identical next level yeah mirror <laughs> twins unbelievable man and then uh leilani kilgore as well which i believe did you just do a recent run with her i did yeah we just got back from colorado uh two days ago actually. nice well, damn, man. Let me uh, let's start just because I'm a big Cozy Powell nerd, so I've got some questions. Uh, there you go. About <laughs> oh man, yeah, I hear you. Cozy, <laughs> not big shoes to fill there at all. <laughs> I know, no, right? No problem. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, you know, and it's funny. I was uh, funny in an ironic kind of bizarre way. I was looking into uh, Gary Driscoll, who was on that first Rainbow record. Uh, uh, with uh, Man on the Silver Mountain and stuff on it. Mm-hmm. And it turns out, I didn't even realize this, but he like he got murdered, and so I believe in someone else's house. It's like stabbed and shot. And then the person whose gun they found, that guy got acquitted. So I believe to this day, it's still unsolved as to who killed him. I Yes, it is. It's totally, totally bizarre. I wasn't aware of that either, because, you know, like Richie's gone through a million different band members. So I just figured... Oh yeah, Gary didn't make it, you know. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, right, he did not make it. <laughs> he didn't he really didn't make it at all. Yeah, that was that was a shocker man to to find that whole thing oh, out. Oh my god. But yeah, mysterious circumstances. Yeah, right. Wow, for sure. At least, yeah. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Jesus. Gary RIP man. Well, yeah, for real, dude. Uh, and then, well, in, and in 76, the year that I came into the world, uh, Rainbow Rising came out. Uh, and when I first heard Cozy's playing on that, I was definitely, and I mean, not to just shine light only on Cozy, this, you know, we're talking drums, so that's natural. But of course, you can't sure. overlook also, you know, Richie Blackmore and Ronnie James Dio and Cozy Powell being in the same band. Yeah. Uh, Yep, that was like that's the the golden triumvirate right there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that record is so incredible. I still rock it all the time. Yeah. It's one of my favorites from '76. But uh, how did you end up hooking up with with Richie and doing the the Rainbow material? Yeah, so I I met him first um, actually through his longtime sound engineer Barry Brostrom, who uh, I I lived in New Haven, Connecticut for 20 years and met Barry. Back in the 90s, actually, I was with a, a band, ironically called Mighty Purple. Oh, wow. OK. Uh, that was like a, yeah, a Connecticut, Connecticut regional national band that was amazing, amazing, amazing band. And uh, Barry was doing sound for them. We became friends through them. And then fast forward, you know, a couple decades later, 
and Blackmore's Night was looking for a new drummer. Barry has been Barry been doing sound for them since pretty much since the inception of that band in uh, the late 90s, 97. Okay. So they had hired a guy and he showed up for they were doing a whole European like six week tour and he showed up for rehearsals and he didn't know any of the material oh. at all. Whoops. <laughs> so I'm eternally grateful to this man yeah. uh, for blowing the gig and everybody scrambling and calling everybody that they know that plays drums and Barry called me. And said, hey, man, you know, here's this band. It's Richie. It's Richie Flick and Blackmore, man, you know. Uh, and I'm, you know, my eyes are like, Phew. yeah. So I, I learned a couple of songs. I made a, a video, threw it up on YouTube so they could see what was going on. They liked it. I, I went down there and, and we played a little bit. He got the band together. Um, they live in Richie and Candace Knight live in Long Island. Okay. They've got a house there. The basement is built like a, an English pub. Like it's got Amazing. the the wraparound bar. Oh yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> so I, he invites me to go there. The whole band is there. We rehearse a little bit down there. And the real interview of course was going to dinner afterwards. And he's, you know, peppering me with questions and yeah. trying to like, you know, assess the cut of my jib and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I, I made the cut for, for Blackmore's night. So that was kind of my, my intro to that. Wow. That was 2012. So fast forward a couple of years after that, I think it was, yeah, it was, it was 2015 and we were, we were all having dinner somewhere and, uh, you know, the booze is flowing. So I end up going to, I'm going to the bathroom when I walk in and Richie's next to me and we're just in the stalls kind of thing. And he says, Dave, I'm thinking of doing some of the old rock songs again. Oh, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking, uh, you know might be kind of fun i'm thinking uh if you i'd like you to play drums if you're interested <laughs> he says like with a little kind of you know uh-huh nudge nudge wink wink i'm like yeah obviously i'm like yeah let me think about it you know like i'll get back to you um <laughs> and so then you know some months go by i don't really hear anything and i get an email uh from our manager that just says okay you know we're we're gonna get together and richie's put this band together and at the bottom of the email it says welcome to rainbow Oh, boy. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. You know, I thought that he was going to just do kind of a fun, nostalgic thing. I didn't know that he was bringing back the name and the band and the whole, you know, the whole thing. And wow. Just, Woo. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he got um, Jens Johansson from Stradivarius to play keys. Um, Bob Nouveau, who was Blackmore's Knights bass player for many years before I was in the band. Um, I didn't know him from then, but, um, he, he knows Bob and trusts Bob and, you know, it's a, it's a really specific gig. Yeah. The sticking point in the whole thing was the singer because Richie's famous for kind of <laughs> finding amazing singers that the world hasn't gotten hip to yet, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, he, he certainly found that in Ronnie Romero, my God. He's been a lot of metal bands and things like that, but he's a huge Purple fan and Rainbow fan. So he would post videos like his some of his bands would play those tunes. And obviously he would just nail the shit out of it. Wow. And uh, Candace, Richie's wife, saw some of those and said, Richie, check this out. This might be the guy. And, uh, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. Damn. Come time to learn those songs. Uh, I mean, obviously, like the intro to Stargazer, for instance, like that, you have to play verbatim, I would imagine. But yes, there's I mean, I don't you know, there's a good bit of fills uh, and everything. I mean, did you get a little bit of leeway and just basically say this is the iconic stuff? I have to nail this. I may have a little freedom here and then just nail the groove and the feel. And, you know, was that kind of the process? Oh, yeah. Interestingly, so wait, I got to start with Stargazer because yeah. uh, a little a little point. If you listen to the original record. You can hear that there's an edit after the the intro bit. Mm. Like he does the whole intro bit, and then when it goes into the song, you can just, if you really pay attention, you can hear that it's an edit mm. and that they they taped that together. Okay. Because apparently, when they're recording it, for whatever reason, the intro, like Richie, just wasn't wasn't really feeling where it was, sort of, and mm. he would he would land a little weird and all that. And so, when it came time to play it live, um, he didn't. They never did the intro typically live. Right. They would just bust into it from something else or whatever because it just it didn't sit right with Richie. Damn. So, you know, come time to play it live. And I'm like, oh man, you know, it's it's Stargazer. I gotta do it. You gotta play that. 
you got to play that. And Richie's like, nah, you know, I never really, I didn't really ever want to do that because it just kind of sounded, it didn't feel like I could land it where I wanted it to be, et cetera. And I'm like, what? <laughs> All right, I have to do something here. So I, I said, um, well, tell you what, I have an idea. What if I did the the fills? I did the whole intro thing. And when it comes time to land on the downbeat, I just hit a cymbal and catch it and stop. And then the crowd goes fucking wild, right? You know, yeah. like, and he's like, uh, you know, okay, maybe, you know, that might work. So we tried it and it totally worked. Of like course I, it did. You know, I did the whole thing, hit the cymbal, bah! did the end, you know, just the end again, a little bit, blah, 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 and do, you know, a couple of times through. Mm -hmm. ah! And then just do the blah, dun, da, dun, da, 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 boom, boom, and we're in. And it totally worked. Nice. Completely worked. And so he let me, he let me keep it. Awesome. Well, damn, I didn't expect that story, but I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> Man. It's, you know, people are going to crucify you on the internet if you don't step up to it. You got to nail that. Yeah, you got to give them that. Absolutely, man. Uh, what were some of the other songs that that you played uh, when y'all did the Rainbow material? And did y'all do Deep Purple material as well? We did, yeah. We did about, uh, I'd say about 75, 25 Rainbow Purple. Wow. Yeah, so the, the first year, 2016, we opened with Highway Star. Nice. Actually. Amazing. Which was, yeah, like super, super cool to open with that. Another Ian Pace fill in there. Dude, you got to play that one too. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let me tell you, man, like Cozy Powell and Ian Pace are these titans, you know? They're two of my all-time favorites, hands down. Their styles are so different mm -hmm. from each other. You know, like Cozy, they both swing. They yeah. both swing. That's where it meets. They've both got a little mm -hmm. jangliness in there. You know, you can tell they were listening to Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich and all those guys. Of course. Cozy has like the raw power. Right. And just open 26 inch kick, open everything, huge symbols, the whole bit, just yep. bombastic. And um, Ian Pace is just smooth and slinky. You know what I mean? Hella chops too. Oh, also he plays it like it's, smooth and easy and he's just like totally. sliding through you know what i mean and mm, so you know it was kind of cool actually i got i'm like all right if if like cozy powell was playing this purple song what would he do mm -hmm. trying to like you know all right what would what would ian pace do on this rainbow tune you know what if he kind of sure threw in a little buzz roll here or something you know like how cool would that be right um but you know sort of in the midst of all this richie is kind of driving the train like not kind of he's driving the bus you mm -hmm. know so they never played stuff live the same way anyway mm -hmm. so i would you know i'd listen to a lot of live rainbow stuff and cozy was always trying different fills and different feels on things and mm -hmm. so i'd try and like soak all that in and then when we actually were rehearsing the stuff you know richie would say yeah you know cozy always did this here and i always wanted him to do this you know and do something different and so i would basically that's that's what i'm working off of um so you know we play through something and he'd say yeah you know i don't like that phil i want something different and so we just start you know I, how about this buh, 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 buh. you know nah that's not it how about this yeah there we go wow and you know he would just drive that train uh until we got it kind of where he wanted it uh which which wasn't always popular with people online either right you know like we we would take stuff um you know, different tempos, different feels on some stuff. He's He'd say, you know, I always want more of a swingy feel on this. All right, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are going, what the hell is this guy doing over here? Right. And you're like, dude, I'm just. <laughs> Bro, I'm taking the orders from the top, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're trying to make this man happy here. Let's yeah. Go. Wow, man. How long would those sets be if the, if you were playing all that material? Uh, I would say typically hour and a half. Okay. You know, maybe maybe hour and forty five if we're cooking. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but I, th I think around ninety, typically ninety minute set was the usual. Nice. Blackmore's night would be more like two two and a half hours. Wow. Um. Yeah, because there was again there was a lot of material and a lot of um like banter between songs, much much more relaxed, much kind of you know goofing around, joking around with people and right. telling stories and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, Rainbow was like completely different you know that's like you know we're getting in there we're gonna rock hard for yeah. for 90 minutes and get out of there 
Yeah. Does he, does Richie still play with a good bit of stage volume? Cause when you watch those deep purple, uh, videos and just live footage, even all mm-hmm. the way up to like burn with David Coverdale, like era deep purple when Richie was still in it and up to rainbow. But I feel like almost, especially like some of the deep purple, like video that I've watched, I'm like the, it seems like fucking white, hot, scorching stage, <laughs> stage volume up there. Like, yeah. good God. Yeah. Look at all them marshals. He can't still be playing like, I mean, he's had to have toned it down. Oh, yeah. 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 Big time. Major. Yeah. We, he likes a nice low stage volume now. Wow. For sure. I think exactly for that reason. You know, you play with a wall of marshals for 40 years. Like, all right, that's good. He, he said to me, somebody was asking once, he's like, you know, I used to play with all these marshals and everything. And, and uh, someone said, why don't you do that anymore? He said, oh, I, I already did that. Yeah. You know, I've done that already. That's not like, you know, it's not exciting anymore to him Mm -hmm. to like blow himself off the stage of volume. So, yeah. Yeah. He's usually typically got just uh, an amp or two, you know, a small, Mm -hmm. like little combo kind of thing. Damn. And uh, that that was a bit of a challenge for me, too, actually, because he wanted the drums to be as quiet as possible, too. For the rainbow stuff? Yeah. So I showed up original uh the first rehearsals for rainbow i have a, a fives kit i used to be a fives in dorsey oh i love back fives. in the day yeah and yeah so i have a i have two a twin 26 inch clear lucite fives kit like Killer. perfect cozy sizes you know like just big and bombastic so i brought that to the first rehearsal thinking i was like the man and uh within a few songs richie's like oh no 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 you know that's way too loud way too fucking loud for oh. the stage I'm like, oh, uh, okay. Dude, that's an adjustment to recalibrate your whole sense of dynamics according to that oh, when yeah. the original was bombastic. Was like swinging for the rafters, you totally. know, big, loud, open, and yeah. Richie's going, no, 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 no. no oh. That was t- way too much. <laughs> oh, I'd be like, fuck, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what am I going to do? Like, all right. So he, when I when I joined Blackmore's Night, um, I inherited the drum kit from the the previous drummer, Malcolm. He bought these beautiful uh, AOTs. When the band first started, it was it was electric drums, actually, because he wanted super quiet and, you know, just samples of cool medieval sounding drums. Mm-hmm. And Malcolm, over time, introduced these drums into the kit and they just look the part. They look old and medieval. So Richie liked them so much, he bought the four piece kit from him when he left the band. Wow. Um, yeah. And said, here, play these. These are cool. I'm like terrific you know these are awesome um but it's just a, it's a 20 inch kick drum uh, a 12 and a 14 and a snare and that's it wow so he said you know what for the rainbow shows i want you to play that kit i love that kit it's it's great it's not loud it looks wonderful you know and i'm thinking jesus christ man you know <laughs> i've got this big badass fives kit which would be the cozy jam <laughs> damn yeah damn <laughs> let me just get this four piece going here so you know sure enough 2016 first year of rainbow i get crucified on the internet who you know look at this guy he's playing uh, okay my favorite comment was uh he looks like he's playing the kit that cozy got on his ninth birthday <laughs> <laughs> i'll give that guy that credit for that <laughs> this guy's up here playing a fucking jazz kit i was like all right that's that's pretty fucking funny <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, yeah. damn, this guy dude. sucks, you know. So next year, I'm like, all right, I got to do something. Um, I looked around for AOT drums, like to make like an add on to try and make it look better, you know, bigger. Couldn't find much on the Internet. They're pretty, you know, it's, it's hard to find those Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And luckily, like that's one of those companies that's kind of been in and out of existence for, you know, over the decades. Yep. I managed to get a hold of them. This is like 2016, late 2016. Mm-hmm. I managed to get a hold of them and talk to it was under new ownership. Yep. Uh, a guy named JD, super nice guy. And I I told him my predicament and I threw my I bet I threw myself at his mercy. I said, I need drums, man. You know, I gotta make something happen. He built three add-on drums, another, another kick drum, another rack tom, and another floor tom. And that's the that's the kit that you see is half Richie's and half mine. Because um, Ayat just, you know, he liked the story and he's like, you know what? I'll build these things for you. You just come up and get them. And wow, holy shit. You know, so my wife and I drove up to Montreal. They're just outside of Montreal. 
Uh huh. And you know, I got to do like the factory tour, and we hung out and had dinner, and the whole thing it was amazing, amazing, amazing. And he matched the stain color and the inlay color and everything. They look beautiful. Damn, dude. What were what were the dimensions that they made for you for your kit? So they made me a, a twenty inch by I think it's a fourteen or sixteen for uh-huh. the you know second kick, uh, a ten by ten to match the 12 by 12 mm-hmm. and uh and a 16 inch floor time there you go to, to complete the set yeah so i had 10 12 14 16 and a couple of 20s and you know if the photographer's down low and <laughs> shooting up it looks looks monstrous you know it looks freaking great right and uh you know so i i get this all to happen and i'm calling richie and leaving him messages like hey man i just wanted to let you know you know this is happening i i got these add-on drums I just want to know how you feel about it. Make sure it's okay, you know, visually and all that. And I, I couldn't get a hold of him. Oh. So now I'm like really shitting my pants because I've, <laughs> I've, I've built this whole kit. I have no idea if he's even going to dig it at all. Right. Oh man. And and so we've got rehearsals. We only rehearse for like a week or two before the tours. Uh, really kind of sparse. So I just show up with this kit. Like, please you know, baby, whoever's up there, let's go, you know, please help me out here. Right. And he comes in, he kind of, he looks around, he looks at the kit and he's studying it. And he just says, oh, they did a great job, didn't they? <laughs> that was it. I'm like, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. man. That is funny. So there we go. And of course, I'm playing exactly the same parts. I'm playing the same volume. I got smaller. I have 17 inch crash cymbals, mm-hmm. you know, nice and small, not trying to make a ruckus. The the thickest, deadest heads I could get from Aquarian. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's I'm playing an old medieval kind of thing. And now the Internet's, oh, oh all right, this guy's getting a little bit better, man. Ah. All right. You know, and it's just I just added some drums. That's all I did. <laughs> Uh, the next year after that, I raised the cymbals up like another foot or so. So now I'm swinging. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. This guy's really, he's starting to, starting starting to, get, to get it, it now. Yeah. yeah. He's been practicing obviously, <laughs> you know? Oh, that is hilarious, man. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, sorry that you had to go through the hellfire. That was the comments because <laughs> Richie wanted you to play a specific kit. Uh, but yeah. it, it did make for a good story. So I do appreciate that. Right on. And I'm, you know, I'm still here. I'm yeah. Alive. You're still there. Still there. <laughs> did, uh, did Richie ever tell you any stories about cozy pal or Ronnie James Dio for that oh, matter? Oh man. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's always, you know, well, especially Blackmore's night, there's a lot more downtime and dinners and things like that. And he'll, he'll start telling stories nice. uh, when we're all hanging out and yeah, he's, he's got some great ones. He loved those guys, you know, I'm sure. Like the, and they, they were all freaking practical jokers like they would do crazy stuff to each other all the time that's funny some of it got pretty intense i mean it's you know the 70s it's like the heyday of crazy rock and roll right and all that and people were just doing crazy shit and there was no you know you weren't going to see it on the internet you weren't (laughs) going to read about it on blabbermouth so they just went for it that's awesome there's all right i think this is a deep purple story they were in europe somewhere and there was a promoter that was just pissing them off Richie especially this guy thought he was like the man and just I don't know what he did but he did something to these guys so Richie had a couple guys right before the show grab this guy they stripped him down naked and attached him to some fly wires like some he calls them Peter Pan wires what really (laughs) they start playing yeah they start playing their set and the promoter is like flies up and he's behind them just swinging there helpless naked during their whole set damn <laughs> yeah yeah oh man luckily you know he, he's chilled out a lot in the later years there's not any of that kind of stuff going on that's hilarious yeah no no cell phone footage of that particular incident no none whatsoever <laughs> that is wild you know i didn't even get into it because we were been kind of going off the rails with uh rainbow rising but on yeah uh, uh long live uh rock and roll as well, another killer record. Uh, Cozy sounds awesome. The whole band is on fire. Did y'all get into any songs from off of that record? Oh yeah, uh, title track. Of course, you got it right. How could you not? Yep, yep. Uh, that one's great too, because um, you know, live halfway through the thing, you could just break it down, kick drum four on the floor, and Ronnie would do like a call and response with the crowd. 
oh, kind nice. of thing, you know, long live and they out rock and roll. All yeah. right, you guys, come on, let's go. You know, get everybody really hyped up. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, coming out of that, there's like this great drum fill and that does a key change up. And it just like the whole energy of the whole place goes crazy. And right. All of that. That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah. From from Elf, which had its own cool tunes, and then of course Rainbow, mm-hmm. and then to Black Sabbath, and then of course like the, his own Dio uh, solo stuff. Yeah, it's just incredible how consistently awesome that guy always was able to be. It's always, always like every every recording you hear, he's like perfect. Yeah, you know, I I don't know how it's unbelievable. It is. Yeah, it's freaking crazy, man. Uh, so what's the story with you playing with the identical twins uh, band, Nelson, from the 90s? How'd that happen? <laughs> All right. This is a great story. <laughs> so uh, I, I moved down to Nashville a few years back, um, kind of going back and forth between Connecticut and Nashville. When we came down here, my my wife is a huge animal rescue advocate and uh, opened and ran a spay-neuter clinic, actually, in Connecticut for a bunch of years mm-hmm. and is an all-around amazing person. So. Uh, we we always have different rescue cats and animals around and that sort of thing. One of our guys uh, became diabetic a few years ago. So we learned a whole, there's this whole world about, you know, feline diabetes and everything. And so fast forward, we come down here, we meet, you know, we're meeting various people. Uh, we have some good friends down here that uh, call up Robin, our friend Amanda, and she says, look, I have this friend, Leanne, and they have a cat who's just been diagnosed diabetic and she's, you know, they're freaking out. They don't know what to do. Uh, It's all kind of new. Would you mind just talking to her about it? Cause you have experience. Sure. Talks to Leanne. They end up becoming great friends. Leanne's husband is Mark Slaughter of the band Slaughter. Oh, Uh, who they live. There's so many rock and roll people that live down here. You would not believe it. Oh, I'm sure. This this like country veneer and then rock and roll underneath. Mm -hmm. So Robin and Leanne become good friends and then just, by proxy, we all get together and I meet Mark and we became great friends, um, having nothing to do with music at all. Mm-hmm. We met because my cat is diabetic. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. Crazy. So Mark, um, we're hanging out and he says, look, I'm really good friends with um, Matt and Gunnar Nelson. They're Ricky Nelson's twin sons. If you remember, they had that that hit song in the 90s. They had a couple of them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. I remember those guys with straight, long, pretty blonde hair. You, you know? got it. Yeah, everybody remembers those guys. Yep. Uh, yeah, if you're Gen X, I mean, that was right. That was right in there. Totally. So, they said, yeah, you know, they do they do a tribute show to their dad called Ricky Re- Nelson Remembered, uh, and it's a really cool show. They have video footage of him, and and they play a bunch of his songs throughout his career, and it's really cool. And they're they're looking for a guy, and I think that you might be a good fit. So, uh, Mark introduced us, and. Boom, right off the bat, we start playing. And those guys are monster musicians, let right. me tell you. Like, yeah, like, you know, I always assume when you see people back in the day on MTV and they look really pretty and stuff and it's super produced sounding, you're <laughs> like, okay. Right. You know, these. I'm sure they can sing, you know, and write stuff. Or maybe somebody wrote that song. Who knows? But maybe it was Studio Magic. Maybe a producer was there. Maybe it was Studio Guys. Yeah, who who knows? knows if they were even on the record. You know? <laughs> right, right. And they're the real deal. For sure. They can play their asses off. So um, great connection there. And after the hair thing was over and grunge came in, they never really did nostalgia shows with that. They kind of launched into doing the tribute to their dad. Mm. Um, But just recently, you know, the past few years, that's getting really huge again. Sure. And, uh, you know, because it's like such a glorious era of music. So Nelson, they decided they were going to dust off the Nelson moniker and jump in, you know, get on some of these package shows with other bands from the era. So I was already playing with them in the trio thing. And they said, hey, you know, we're assuming you can play rock and roll, right? You play with Richie Blackmore. I'm like, yeah, I can, you know, I'm, I'm into that. Yeah. I can do some of that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they they got a couple of guys together. Um, J.J. Ferris, who's out of Ohio, he was in a, a band called Slam and Gladys back in the day okay it was super killer um and neil zaza who's like a, a guitar shredding legend nice amazing amazing guy so they they got those guys together and put put nelson together uh and jumped in we we had to do uh last year uh what was it was it we played with firehouse a bunch there's the band steelheart mm-hmm. i think their singer 
something happened with him. He was having some health issues. <clears throat> they had to drop off some shows. And uh, they said, hey, Nelson, you know, you guys ready to go? Let's go. Can you do these 12 Steelheart shows? We had two weeks to put the band together. Like, Whoa. Boom, 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 boom. You know, three days of rehearsals with all of their material and the, you know, background tracks and the whole bit, get the whole show together. Right. And slide in there and do those Steelheart shows. So it was, it was a, it was another sort of quick trial by fire thing. Mm -hmm. But man, what a band. Jesus. Like, so, so good. Everybody's just monsters and the shows that y'all did play like they, they were they ended up being pretty good shows and everybody was feeling pretty good about putting it all together yeah it was uh it was last summer and so it was a lot of like outdoor festival kind of things mm -hmm. um we played with uh slaughter actually in the first one gotcha uh we played, we played with great white um okay uh, winger um you know what was the oh uh firehouse a lot yeah uh yeah just all these awesome bands from back then total 80s you know i yeah 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 i mean rod morgenstein from winger holy shit he's incredible like he's he's a monster man Absolutely. And, and you know getting to meet him you know i i was i remember listening to that when i was 13 thinking like this guy's freaking crazy he was always <laughs> in modern drummer and everything and yeah. you know i'm like oh my god it's him and he's just like a nice guy he's just cool right just like, hey, man, great. And, you know, getting to see him play, he's still got every bit of chop that he ever had. I'm sure. It's, yeah, it's awesome. The the run that you just did recently, it sounded like you went to Colorado, uh, Lalani Kilgore. Uh, what is your connection, I guess, with that band? And how, is, what, how has that been playing those shows? Yeah, that's a, a, a complete switch of gears and uh, like so much fun i can't even tell you it's she's uh like blues based rock and roll mm -hmm. and she's kind of uh getting away a little bit from the blues and going more to the rock and roll end of things but mm -hmm. she just plays freaking she is a searing lead guitarist like par excellence like unbelievable um and can sing her ass off as well and writes amazing songs nice so yeah i i jumped in with those guys about a year ago a little over a year ago um they're her her guitar player, John Wise Carver, was my introduction to the whole thing. We had met through um, a guy named Josh Paul. He was a bass player in, uh, who was he with? He was with Daughtry for a while and mm -hmm. uh, Infectious Grooves. And, nice. You know, some some awesome. Anyway, he, he's a killer dude. He introduced me to this guy, John Wise Carver, uh, incredible, incredible player. And we were at a, a jam night. There's a lot of jam nights in Nashville, mm -hmm. which are, are really cool. They're just great places to meet fellow musicians and you get to play with them you know you just go on stage with a song you've been assigned and a band that you've never met before and just you know go for it nice so i, I played with john in one of those and uh we're hanging out and i said look you know I, i'm i'm playing with these guys but i would love to jump in with like a real original band that's kind of like making its way up you know mm -hmm. um and he said well it just so happens i got the band for you brother you know and <laughs> There it was. And uh, yeah, it's it's really, really fun playing with these guys. You know, who could predict the future? But she's she's got it. She's got the the goods. I wholeheartedly believe that, uh, you know, the right sort of gatekeeper sees what she's doing and uh, opens the door. She'll she'll be wildly successful. Hell yeah, man. That's really good to hear. Yeah. So it sounds like you've been playing with Lilani uh, on and off for, for a little stretch here. Have you recorded anything with her and or the full band in a studio? And or do you have, I guess, you know, any plans of doing so in the semi near future? We did recently uh, go into the studio together uh, as a full band, which she's never done with her live band before. OK. Uh, and we cut, I want to say six songs. We just like burned through them. It was it was pretty awesome. It was like the the old days. You go in there with the actual full band and get to the, you know, far away from each other in the big room in the studio as you can and and just, you know, rip your tunes. Absolutely. Uh, really, yeah, really cool experience. So the first of those called Steal Your Love, that just came out, I want to say two weeks ago, maybe. Okay. Uh, two or three weeks ago. So that's the first single off of that um, upcoming EP. And uh Leilani's actually been writing a ton of new material as well. So we're going to jump back in the studio, I think, in the next couple of months when the the summer thing kind of slows down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, same kind of thing. We're going to go in there and bust out a whole bunch of new music. And, uh, yeah, we've got a, a four-show opening slot with Ace Monroe. 
okay. uh, who I'm looking forward to seeing. I've never seen live before. Uh, we're going to go jump on his tour down Florida for, for a few dates. And uh, then I think hit the studio hard after that. Nice, Get some man. new tunes out there. Yeah, man. Uh, how old were you when you first started playing drums? I was okay. Well, when I was about four, my, my parents, my mom was super musical. Uh, my dad has great taste in music. So I was listening. They always have music on the house mm -hmm. and I was starting to like hit stuff. I would grab like wooden spoons and play along. Yep. My mom had some John Davidson records. <laughs> okay. Smooth and, you know, smooth crooning, nice and slow, mm -hmm. steady tempo, you know? So I would just try and like play along with that. And, uh, they were shockingly supportive of me playing drums uh because it was i guess it was kind of apparent you know it was obvious nice. and uh, uh my folks got me lessons starting from eight and i i took lessons for about 10 years wow who did you study with a particular teacher yeah there's a guy named rob gottfried and he goes by rob the drummer he's got a whole uh my mom actually went to high school with him he's a incredible incredible drummer and he he was on sesame street actually oh damn all right <laughs> like in the i think in the early 80s maybe or late 70s okay uh but he has a he has a cool a really cool like anti-drug uh show that he takes to schools and he's got a big massive that's how i got into clear fives drums he has this huge fives kit ah. um and he you know he has kids come up and play them and he it's basically like you know you can get into sports or music or something and that's gonna light you up and you don't have to do drugs and hang with the bad crowd, you know, all that stuff. Right. Very uplifting, uplifting show. But he, he taught me for 10 years, definitely um, more in the rock and roll vein of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but concurrent with that, I was also in the school jazz band. So on the, the other end, I'm like learning swing and big band and, and all that kind of stuff too. So I was super, super lucky that I had both of those things kind of informing my playing. Right. Uh, to, to give me that kind of, you know, Richie, Richie Blackmore wants a drummer that can swing. Mm -hmm. He wants he wants to play rock and roll, but with a little bit of a bounce to it, you know. And I, yep, that can be kind of a a rare thing. Um, so I was I was really lucky to come up that way. Yeah, man. To revert back to that uh, to something you mentioned earlier, which was Mighty Purple. I'm assuming was that a, a Deep Purple tribute band that was regional or no? No, no not correlation. At all. Had nothing, no correlation whatsoever. It was, okay, uh, it was all original, completely original. Um, you know, '90s alternative, explorative rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, you could think like Smashing Pumpkins ish, but with more harmonies. It was two brothers writing stuff, and uh, yeah, it was a it was a four piece bass drums, two guitars, uh, who were brothers and sang incredible harmonies together. And yeah, that band almost made it. We had we had a deal with Sony and a big manager, and and like the whole team lined up and the whole thing kind of fell apart unfortunately gotcha uh in the late 90s i was with them for a few years that was the first time i ever toured uh in my life we had a we had a big old winnebago and we'd go crashing around the Damn. states and it was it was glorious it was like everything you want in your early 20s you know right yeah so that you know i got bit by the bug real hard after that i was like this is it this is all i'm doing screw it yeah <laughs> that's amazing and it sounds like it's and it sounds like moving to nashville was a, was a good call absolutely yep it was really really good you know i was i was playing with richie uh i had an original band with my sister for a bunch of years called mission zero mm -hmm. uh in connecticut and um after that it was i was just kind of looking like you know rainbow and blackmore's night both play you know, not a ton of shows every year. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, I, I got to do something. I'm just kind of sitting here. And uh, we decided it was either going to be Los Angeles or uh, or Nashville. And we went to both places, hung out, tried to get a feel for the scene and all that. And Nashville is just, you know, there's so much music here. By and large, everyone here is here to work and they're here to be supportive of each other. That's, mm. It's like huge here to be, you know, to really help each other and not just cut each other off at the knee to get gigs and right and whatever else there's there's much more of a, a supportive nature here you know so that was super appealing and uh yeah it's been it's been great you're not that far from me i'm like 40 minutes south of atlanta so we actually go up to nashville oh, cool. pretty frequently i've got an my wife's uncle is in he's like an hour outside of nashville way out in the country we go out to okay. his house and stuff and then go hit the smoky mountains and 
Oh, man. Just being able to do all of that alone yeah. is amazing. And Nashville, every time I've been, I've always had a great time. It's just such a great music town. I really dig it as well. Oh, that's awesome. Next yeah. time you're coming through, man, let's definitely hang out. Absolutely, man. We'll get ourselves a beverage. There you go, buddy. What else is going on for the rest of the year, man? Oh, let's see what's happening. Uh, more Nelson shows, more Ricky shows. Um, doing two more Blackmore's Night shows at the end of this month um, up in New Jersey. What's is going on? Uh, recording with Leilani. Yep. You know, hopefully I'm, I, I do a lot of uh, like remote session type stuff. I've got this little room here and I'm always, you know, I'm always ready to go for, you know, doing tracks for people if they need it. Awesome. And uh, yeah, just keep this little wheel rolling down the road, you know? <laughs> keep it going, dude. Right yeah. on. Well, David, it was fun catching up with you, man. Uh, I appreciate the time. Great to hear all those stories. And I always love a good Cozy Powell nerd out. So you you quenched my thirst in that regard. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you so much for having me. It's It's been awesome talking with you. All right. Thanks again for tuning in. That does it for this one. But be on the lookout for my 300 episode coming right around the bend. We'll catch y'all on the flippy floppy. Crash, bang, boom!